Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Can you all see me? I think the screen share is still on. Hallelujah. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Happy New Year. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining from. It's great to have you join us today. It's going to be an awesome day. I am really excited as usual. And we are going to be starting with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you so much for all you've done for us. Thank you for keeping us throughout the year 2023. Thank you for a new dawn, a new beginning, a fresh start. 2024, our year to testify. Lord, we thank you. We look to you today. Our eyes are on you. Speak to us. Minister to us. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to be worshiping God for a few minutes, and then I'll be back. And all our ministers are in the house, so it's going to be awesome. Awesome. It's a different tangent today. So I'm expecting you to reach out to your friends. If you are not here yet, tell them we've started wherever they are. We want everybody to join us today. God bless you, and I'll be back with you in about two minutes. Good God, we serve. Hallelujah, God, we thank you again. Thank you. What a good God you are. What a good God we serve. Thank you again for joining us today. My name is Fumi QJ. This is Single But Not Satisfied. Our first event in this awesome year, 2024. It's always an honor to have you here with us. And we thank you. If this is your first time of joining, let's know, put something on the chat, say something. Thank you. We have an event every month. We look forward to seeing you. This is a Christian organization. We have a vision and an assignment from God to encourage, to equip you, and to inspire you and motivate you as a mature single on a journey to be married. So this platform is for mature singles who are believing to be married. And as I said, we we'll equip you with tools, both natural, spiritual, every tool that there is on your marital journey. So we meet every month. It's the same Zoom link. So if you have the Zoom link saved, you just need to know what the dates are and you join in. Today we'll be talking about marital intelligence. Hallelujah. How come people take driving lessons before they start driving a car, but we never take lessons for the most important journey on our walk on this planet, which is marriage. Marriage is a very, very long walk. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. So we need a lot of wisdom along this journey so today i want you to begin to drop your questions questions on marriage or anything to do with relationships drop it on the chat and as we proceed i trust you're going to be superbly blessed our ministers are all in the house today our our um single but not satisfied ministers they're all here set set with god's blazing hallelujah i can't see my brother yes just if you spotlight him please so Jolomi, you're welcome, everybody knows Jolomi. If you've been here once or twice, Jolomi is one of our ministers he's, he's, and he's an excellent man of God. He's going to introduce himself. Jolomi, please go ahead and introduce yourself before you start. Happy New you. Year, everybody. Happy New Year. I hope you had a wonderful Christmas and excellent start to 2024. Welcome to Single But Not Satisfied. My name is Jolomi Oboro. I um, kind of help out on the platform from time to time, you know. Um, have some discussions, raise some issues, <laughs> cause confusion. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to be able to, to speak to you guys. Uh, thank you for being with us in 2023 and being with us in 2024. No offense taken, I don't want to see you in 2025. You should be married by then. Uh, and we are aiming at um, getting you all married. They can come and support us. <laughs> <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Um, just as the music was playing, one thing came to my mind, and I thought I'm gonna just start with that. Don't judge a book.
by its cover. Do not judge a book by its cover. I just like that to sink in a little bit. You might see a book, see the title, see the picture on it, but not know the content. Don't judge a book. Give a benefit of doubt. Have a read. Spend some time. Listen carefully. You might surprise yourself. Okay, that was for free. The rest is chargeable. <laughs> um, I've been thinking about this message for a while and couldn't really come up with something catchy. But um, throughout the, the latter part of um, last year, there was a consistent theme that kept on coming to me. And, and I'm sure it's not just myself. Um, I've heard some of the ministers mention one or two things about certain things um, in our work. And yes, there's a, there's a place for prayers. There's a place for, should I say, spiritual exercises. But there's also a practical place as well. And that practical place is where we have a very large part to play. Unfortunately, because it's within our hands, it's something that we can immediately do something about. It's something that we have complete control over. We have control over our thoughts. We have control over our actions. We have control over what we do and how we go about it. We are in complete control of our destiny when it comes to personal decisions that we are making for ourselves, when it comes to personal choices that we are making, when it comes to places where we are at a crossroad and we need to make a decision, that decision, those choices um, lay squarely with us. To a large extent, those choices are governed or directed or influenced by things that may or may not have happened in the past, it might be directed by our upbringing, it might be directed by our circumstances that we have found ourselves in. But when the rubber hits the road, we make a choice. We make a choice of how to act. We make a choice on what to say. We make a choice on how to live. We make a choice on the things that we do. Some of the choices are excellent choices. Some of those choices might not be that excellent. So in 2024, I'd like us to uh, encourage us to um, make the right choices. And I guess part of my message would be to help us to look more into ourselves and assess the, the, the decisions that we make and where we find ourselves in life to enable us to make different choices going forward. I'll start with a scripture, James chapter one, starting from verse 23. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholded himself and went his way, and straightway forgetted what manner of man he was. But whoso looked into the perfect law of liberty and continued therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So what this scripture is basically saying, and the way I want to focus on, is that when we look at ourselves, in the mirror. In other words, when we are being completely honest with ourselves, completely honest, we take a good look at ourselves in the mirror, we do a reflection of what happened in the past, we be completely honest in the things that we've done, the choices that we've made, and we see ourselves for who we truly and really are, and what we are portraying to the rest of the world, and we say to ourselves, this is good. Or we say to ourselves, hmm, this is not so good. I need to make a change. The key thing here for me is not when you look yourself in the mirror and be honest. 
and you say to yourself that this needs to change, and then you go away and then you forget, as the scripture says, you forget what you have seen in the mirror, and then you go back to doing the same old thing that you used to do before. This scripture here for me talks about continuity in remembering what you have seen in the mirror and making the decision that henceforth I'm going to change, I'm going to make some, I'm going to implement some things that would help me to make better choices and, and, and in, in the end those better choices will lead to better decisions and those better decisions will lead to better results for me. So yes, it's well, all well and good. And this is what we do uh, a lot of the time at the very beginning of the year. We look ourselves in the mirror. We come up with new year resolutions. We make up our mind that this year, this is going to be my new year resolution. This is going to be what I'm going to do from the start of the year to the end of the year. Statistics have shown that 80% of people will fail to keep the year resolution, 80%. One of the resolutions that people come to most of the time um, is weight loss. Both men and women, we want to go through a certain regime, we want to look better, we want to eat better, we want to live healthier. And so we come up with um, all kinds of diets and intermittent um, um, diet, the Atkins diet, the low carb diet, the vegan diet, the ketogenic diet, just, just to name a few of them. And we make, we choose one of them and we make up our mind that this is what we're going to do to help us to, to help change um, the way we look. Well, research su suggests that roughly 80% of people who shed a significant portion of their body fat, so we're not saying it doesn't work, <laughs> all of the, these weight loss programs, they do work. If you implement them um, um, in, in, in the manner that it's, it's been described, you will get the results. But we're saying here that 80% of people who shed significant portions of, 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 of body fat will not maintain that degree of waste loss for 12 months. 80% of people. Statistics show that 90% of all diets fail. 90% of all diets fail. But why is that? The reason why they fail is not because they don't work, because we have shed the weight, but because there's a lack of consistency. So when it comes to diets, when it comes to new, new year resolutions, when it comes to looking yourself in the mirror, um, find out there are certain things that need to that need to change. It's not really a question of doing it for a month, for two months, and setting it aside. It's a question of implementing it in your day to day routine so that it becomes a lifestyle change. So if, for example, we decide that at the beginning of this year, you're, you're, the way you're gonna lose weight is by going out for a jog, just a jog for 10 minutes every day. And you do that consistently throughout the course of the year. You do that so much so that you begin to enjoy it, but it's not really more or less a diet anymore. It's not a sacrifice to lose weight anymore. It's a lifestyle that you now enjoy. And because you now enjoy um, doing this particular exercise, you'll find out that you will consistently lose weight and consistently um, be on the path to where you want to be because you will not stop in carrying out that 10 minutes or 30 minutes of exercise that you have been doing. And the same thing applies to having a diet. When you consistently do it and you have a lifestyle change, that becomes now part of your lifestyle. Your goals become attainable and sustainable 
not only will you be able to attain that goal, you will be able to sustain the goal. So again, we go back to that image of us looking in the mirror and recognizing who we are and the things that we need to do. And when it comes to choosing a lifetime partner, maybe we need to look a little bit deeper. Remember, we went to the mirror, we're looking at ourselves and think that we need to change. And that change more or less comes from a change in our mindset. And that mindset is, has a direct impact on our character. That change in character would lead definitely to a change in our actions. It will change the way we relate to people. It will change the places that we go. It will change the people that we hang out with. It will change the way we think. And when that happens, there is always a direct impact on the relationships that we have. I mean, if you go back over the past and begin to um, ha have a best eye view of your relationship that didn't succeed in the past, maybe through no fault of yours, maybe through some fault of yours, and you begin to see a common theme that runs through them, maybe that current theme needs to be looked up, looked at closely, and that, that recurring theme needs to change. Just as an example, if you are somebody who is extremely untidy in, in, in the home, uh, you, you can't really be bothered because you know you're living by yourself and you're extremely untidy un untidy. If you don't make a change to tidying up your place, there are consequences in doing that. But if you dedicate an hour a day, 30 minutes a day to consistently changing the way your house look, looks, in the end, you will have a nice tidy home that anybody can walk into at any time of the day without you having to run around and you know furiously try and tidy up five minutes before they arrive. Just as an example. So the choices that we make affect our character. The character that we have will, in most cases, dictate the kind of people that we can hang out with. Remember, the key here is consistency. It's not just doing it once. It's not just doing it twice. It's making it a lifestyle. So my challenge to us all is that we go to that mirror and have a good look in the mirror and look at ourselves honestly, and recognize the faults and the flaws. Write them down if necessary, but always remember them when you've walked away because that's when the change begins to take place. It's not when you see yourself in the mirror and you recognize, you say, oh, that's not good. I need to change this, that, and the other. But if you go away and forget what you have seen and forget the fact that you need to make those changes, then nothing is going to change. My focus is on character for both the men and the women. What do you recognize in your character that may have caused upset to other people. Maybe you've never been in a relationship. Someone will say, oh, I've never had a boyfriend. I've never had a girlfriend. So uh, yeah, but you have brothers or sisters. You have colleagues. You have um, you, you have cousins. You have uncles. How, what, what, what have they said about you? Is there a current theme? Oh, that one to the vex. It gets angry too much. What, what, what have people said that seems to be a consistent theme in your life? What do you think? Are you easy to live with? Would you say you're a very easy person to live with? I'm not talking about when you see your friends for 30 minutes and then everything is hunky-dory. I'm saying when, when someone's in your face, in your space, 24 hours, 24 seven, how do you react? Are you open to make sacrificial changes in the way you do things? Are you open to making changes in your lifestyle? How do you see your social status? Do you have one? Why do you have one? 
why is it so important for you to look a certain way, act a certain way, be seen a certain way, be perceived up in a certain way? Why is that so important to you? Why is it so important for you to be seen in a certain car, living in a certain house, have a certain job? Why is it so important for you to be seen through the eyes of your social status? Has that been hindering you in the past? Or has that been opening doors to you? What are the habits that you've picked up along the line that's now become so much a part of you that ah, it's just me. I can't do anything about it. Yet it might be impacting on your relationships with people. Or do you have the impression that, yeah, this is just who I am. So, you know, you're just going to have to live with it. What are the things that you can change? Are you a considerate person? Or is it just about me, 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 me? When you come to relationships, is it about what you can get out of the relationship? Or is it about, is it about what you can give to the relationship? It's more blessed to give than to receive. Are you the one that needs to have all your needs met? every single time because that's the way you feel loved and appreciated or are you the person who wants to give and make the the man or the woman feel satisfied and fulfilled character changes and i think there's a lot more to be said I tried to continue with my notes <laughs> and I had to stop because I, I was going to deep dive into a few things and I found out that I might not have enough time. I might need to break this down over a couple of sessions and talk about it in depth. So this is, I, I would say, merely an introduction. But that introduction is where we look into the mirror, recognize ourselves for who we are and what we are, being completely honest. No one's there. It's just you are the mirror. You write them down and make a decision to implement consistent change over a period of time. And I'm saying that that consistent change will bring about not only changes in the way you look for the people you interact with, and hopefully to a life partner that you'll come across along the way. I'll leave you here with a, with a story, one of this. Um, videos that you receive from time to time. So there was this guy who took his girlfriend out for, for lunch, invited her to come out for lunch. And what she did was she also invited a friend along with her. So they all sat down and they were eating. And uh, uh, the girlfriend's friend finished eating ahead of them and she called the waiter and asked the waiter to prepare um, a package for her as takeaway. And the guy immediately interjected, hey, waiter, make sure she's paying for that bill because I'm not paying for it. The girlfriend took off and was asking the boyfriend, like, hey, why, why are you doing that? Why, why are you disgracing me? The guy got annoyed with her. He said, look, if this is the kind of attitude that you have, as a matter of fact, waiter, this is my money for the food I've eaten. Collect the money for both of them for the food that they've eaten. I'm not paying for it. Character. What kind of wife would you be? Actually, let's, let's not go that far. What kind of girlfriend would you be? The one in the story, or someone who will be reasonable and respectful to her man. 
And it works both ways. For the man as well, what kind of man would you be? The one that the woman would look up to and respect, or the one that the woman would walk away to and point back at you with their left hand? It's time for sober reflection. That's what we do at the beginning of the year. So let's go look in that mirror and write down things that we can change and things that we can consistently implement throughout the course of 2024. I hope this has been helpful. God bless you. And I'm sure you enjoy the rest of it. Thank you very much. Thank you again. So by reflections, January. Some of you are coming to us with the relationships. You're starting relationships. You have met people following the prayers. Keep us informed. Carry us along. We're here to support you. And on that note, I will bring up Dipsy, Dipsy, go for it. Hello, everyone. Hello. Thank you very much for being here. Happy New Year. And uh, we're delighted to be of service to you again this year. And like you heard already, we're hoping that this would be the year that you will find your spouse. And uh, the next time you come, you'll be coming to share your testimony. In Jesus' name. So I'm going to dive more into the practicalities of um, marriage intelligence. I think we did marriage intelligence 101 a couple of years ago, or maybe it was last year, I can't remember. But I'm going to look at it from the point of view of where your destination is going to be. So we're focusing on marriage which is the destination that you want to be at. And I'm gonna start with a quick um, story, just my experience. Um, in the late, oh, I'm gonna date myself now, but in the late 80s, me to late 80s, there was a pastor that used to come to my church in London. Um, he visited a couple of times, I think. And um, he was very, very um, anointed speaker, you know, anointed man of God. And he had a seminar in my church at that time, and it was called Love, Relationship, and Marriage. I think it was a three-day seminar, seminar, if I recall. So it was very exciting for all the single people in my church. We we're all very young at that time, you know, you know me to, to uh, around me twenties then, and um, we we're all excited about this seminar. And so, like I said, I believe it was a three-day seminar um, because the um, the conference was recorded and those days again I'm dating myself we used to have cassette tapes and so it was recorded in cassette tapes and uh, I remember I had three because I had purchased it after the end of the seminar so day one was talking about love day two was talking about relationship and day three was talking about marriage so I had three cassette tapes so it was an amazing um, delivery by this pastor and um, over the years um, well, after the seminar, obviously, he gave us some very good tips on, you know, what to do, you know, when you're getting into a relationship, what falling in love means, you know, and all the strategies you need to be able to find your partner and get into a relationship and eventually get into marriage. And I did follow the um, strategies that he had um, provided for us. And in due time, I did, um, I did get married, which is wonderful. And I do remember um, while I was married at that time, I would listen to the tapes. I would even share it with some of my friends who are still single and say, you know, this is just amazing information that can help you to lead you into marriage. However, what I found was I typically only listened to tapes one and two, which talked about love and marriage and relationship and all the wonderful strategies. And, um, you know, I never really put much effort into the third tape. Years later, as I was going through a divorce, for some of you who know my testimony, I went through a divorce. And it was while I was packing up my stuff, leaving the house, I was packing up my stuff. I actually came and found this, this cassette. And I did realize I'd kept it that long. And so um, during that time, I decided that I would listen to them. 
uh, in particular, I listened to tape three, which talked about marriage. And it was amazing what I found was um, on tape three. I mean, I'd listened to it before, but hadn't paid attention to it. And it was when I listened to tape three and was talking about marriage and what the expectations are in marriage that I truly understood that it is not how, it's not about how you get into marriage, but how you stay in marriage. And so even though we're teaching you practical steps on finding the right partner, the most important thing is having how to navigate your marriage to make sure that it's a wonderful experience for you and that you have enough knowledge and experience to retain yourself in your marriage. And so I start just a little nugget of, of um, truth that I'd like to share with you. So first of all, um, in marriage, you know, like I typically um, explain, you know, I, I, I put our intentions for marriage side by side with intentions for looking for a job, you know, and job employment. It's similar to when you put all your best foot forward because you're trying to learn the job. And um, so we prepare and we nail the interview questions um, because, you know, we prepared, we know what to do and we get the expect and we get the job. However, when you get into the job, there are four things that you're going to discover. First of all, there's a learning curve. So you're now in this company, you're learning new things. Um, so even though you've come in with qualifications that helped you to get the job, you are learning new things. So there is a learning curve in order for you to be you know, properly engaged with your work. Secondly, there's a probationary period. So there's a time when, you know, your boss, your, your superiors, your colleagues are monitoring you, making sure that you are putting your best foot forward and you are, you are giving them the qualifications and the experience that you said you had when you were, when you were interviewed for the job. The third thing is when we are in a new position, in a new company, we tend to find out that there are certain things that we were not expecting. There's is never what we expected going in. It could be that, you know, you thought, you know, they had such a large, you know, marketing, whatever department, and you get in there and realize that, oh, it's really small. Whatever it is, there's always something in the job that you didn't expect. And finally, um, working with people comes um, always has some kind of challenges. So there will be conflicts with your subordinates, conflicts with your colleagues, conflicts with your superiors, and you have to learn how to navigate, you know, those conflicts in order for you to be to to be successful at your job and to ensure that you are making progress. So now I'm going to use those same, I'm going to use those same um, strategies in terms of getting into marriage. So based on all the things that you've learned with regards to finding the right partner, making sure it's the right partner and getting into marriage, there are also some things in marriage, the same things you have the learning curve in marriage, which is you're now adapting to each other. For many of you who are mature singles, we tend to be set in our ways. We women were set in our ways the way we want things done. So a man set in, our, in their ways, in the way they want things done. One of the things is what my husband said in terms of, you know, you might be an untidy person and you want to prepare yourself so that when you get married, you can adapt to your, to your spouse. The same thing appears, ap applies if you are a very neat person, like you're a neat freak. It may be good for you and wonderful, but that might be something that might be a challenge when you get into marriage. So there's that learning curve when you first get to know each other in the marriage. For the probationary period, it's kind of like an extended honeymoon. You know, you're giving yourself grace, receiving grace. The love is all good. You're starting new intimacy together. It's just wonderful. But it's still a probationary period because the time will come when you now settle into the marriage. Where, which is the third one, and that's when the things that we did not expect start to creep up, you know. Some of them are good, you know, like, you know, maybe you didn't even realize that this person had 
you know, this kind of characteristics that are wonderful. And then you now find out that they do have that. Some of them may be challenging. There may be some things that you didn't realize that this person had, and they've now come up in the marriage. And you're now wondering how to navigate that. And the final thing is um, conflict. So conflict is an ongoing spice in marriage. And that is not necessarily a bad thing. It just means that you have different backgrounds, you've had different experiences, and you've had different ways of navigating goals and objectives and strategies. And now you have to put your head together in marriage to you know, work together. And there might be conflicting ideas, but it needs to be addressed. Um, you, so in marriage, you have to learn how to address so that both of you are committed on both ends and then you, you, you can strengthen and secure your marriage. So based on this um, four strategies, how do you um, find your way through intelligently? You know, we call it marriage intelligence to ensure that you are prepared for marriage. And I'm just giving you three principal things that we need to um, work on as, we, as you are working through this um, process in finding your spouse, start working on these three principal things so that when you get into marriage, you'll be able to navigate this for learning curve, learning curve, probationary period, unexpected issues, and, and then conflicts. The first one is wisdom. The Bible says wisdom is the principal thing. And so in order to navigate in your marriage, you need to have wisdom. You need to ask God for wisdom. And the Bible says that God will give it to you liberally. You have to navigate building two lives together to a common goal. And with wisdom, when your spouse says something and it doesn't quite gel with you, you need the wisdom of God to be able to see between the lines and see how there is still a common goal that you can work together. You need wisdom in ad adapting to in-laws and extended families. So for mature singles, you're probably going to, be going to be going into a blended family because depending on what the age bracket your spouse is, it is possible that they already have um, um, children. And of course you are going to have in-laws. So you need wisdom in order to navigate and um, build relationships, not just with your spouse, but with the children. Sometimes they are adult children and also with your, with your in-laws. You need wisdom to keep accountability. It, it is wise to keep accountability friendships when you're in marriage. Just some people that you might need to banter with. It doesn't mean that you run to people and talk all about your marriage um, when you have issues, but you need it. it it, it is wise to have someone to banter with that would help you to see things differently and help you to navigate um, some of the challenges that may come up in your marriage. Um, in 1 Peter 5, the Bible says, um, afflictions will come. It says the same, um, in chapter nine, it says the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren, which means there will be challenges, there will be issues, because we're human beings and we're relating together. With wisdom, you would add, you will be able to navigate some of the challenges that are coming. For example, money issues. You know, maybe your spouse has some relatives that are, you know, putting a bit of a strain on the family budget. You need wisdom to be able to navigate that. Yeah, maybe the adult children refuse to move out because it's cheaper to live rent-free. You need wisdom to be able to navigate that with your spouse so that you're still on the same page but you're making decisions that will um, bless both of you. Um, going into a marriage, there could be challenges of job loss, probably you, probably your spouse. So even though you're praying you know, for this man who has a job and all that, sometimes life happens. You, know, you can go in with a lot of um, financial, um, you know, um, like you know with a good job and financial blessings but life happens in a marriage and if things like if something like that happens what would you do you need wisdom from God how to navigate that and there are times when you have different goals you know he wants to do this and you want to do something else you know wisdom helps you 
to find a common goal to make sure you're working in the same direction. And finally, bad habits. I think um, a lady has put a, a, a wonderful book in the chat about navigating habits. We have to, like my husband said, look in the mirror and be honest with ourselves. Some of our habits that may not be beneficial when you're in a relationship. So we need the wisdom of God to navigate some of our habits. As a woman, for example, you talk to your mother every day, 24 seven. You need to kind of manage that when you get married. And the same thing goes for, 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 for a man. Um, maybe you are the, the man that's, you know, a prayer warrior and you're in church, you go to the Bible study, you go to the men's meeting, you go all of that. When you're single, that's fine. But when you're married, it needs to be um, adjusted into your new way of life so that it doesn't cause conflict. The next area we need to prepare is love. Uh, we all know that uh, love, the Bible says um, faith, hope, and love. But love is the greatest thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Um, particularly, there's, there's this scripture that says, love your neighbor as yourself. We focus a lot about loving our neighbor, but in that same scripture, it says you have to love yourself. And if you know how to love yourself, you will be able to love your spouse, which means you need to take time to make sure that you are in a, in a, in a good place. Um, you practice self-love. Um, in the courtship period, you make sure that you're setting the right foundation for yourself in order to be able to manage the love that you are going to express in your marriage. Um, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7, 34, that a woman that is married cares for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. It's just something that happens to us. We just get so engrossed in our um, spouses that we lose ourselves in our marriage. We need to learn how to practice self-love because when you are full, um, your tank is full of love, you will be able to give love. The same thing also in um, Genesis 3, 16, the Bible says that thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. So we need to know how to share the love that God has given us in our marriage to make sure that it's a wholesome relationship. Marriage is a work of love. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it first talks about what love isn't. So in marriage, love is not self-seeking, is not easily angered, it keeps no record, it delights not in evil. These are the things we need to start working on now. And the other part of 1 Corinthians 13 talks about what love is. It says that love rejoices with the truth, it always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, and it always perseveres. So love is critical for your marriage. Love covers a multitude of sin. The last thing that we need to prepare for as we go into marriage is prayer. We know that prayer is key in our lives as an individual and also when we get into marriage. But what I really want to focus on in terms of prayer is your one-on-one -on -one relationship with God behind closed doors. The Bible says, he that prays in secret that um, he that prays in secret, that God will hear, who hears in secret, will reward you openly. Many people are replacing their personal relationship with God with group prayers. And there's nothing wrong with going to group prayers, but fundamentally, you must have your own relationship with God. The 24-hour relationship should be between you and God. Do not replace it with gatherings. You need to hear from God on yourself. You need to develop that relationship where you can hear from the Holy Spirit by yourself. In 1 John 2, 26, it says, you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things. And the anointing is the truth and is no lie. Even as he has taught you, you can abide in him. Focus on your one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. God hears from you and he is there to um, respond to you. So um, there is a place for covenant partners, a place for prayer of agreement, but that is not where the full focus should be. 
The full focus is our one-on-one -on -one intimacy with God and the others are just additional to that. Um, if we look at the Lord's Prayer, it doesn't focus on us just asking God for things. In fact, if you look at the, 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 the prayer, that Jesus Christ taught us, there's only one sentence that says, give us this day our daily bread. In our one-on-one -on -one relationship with God, we develop the other things that are part of our prayer life. You know, worshiping God, knowing what the kingdom is. The Bible says, seek you first the kingdom of God and marriage will be added onto it. These are things that you develop as you have your one-on-one -on -one relationship with God and prepare yourself for marriage. And... Um, I think the last thing I'm going to say is in your devotion with God, God will give you the wisdom you need. He will teach you the love you need and he will give you a, 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 a good understanding and a good background to be able to use when you get into marriage and continue, of course, in the same prayer, prayer life. So in summary, what we need to practice now as in uh, marriage intelligence one or two is to pray to God for wisdom love love according to the love of God love and forgive and finally pray in your secret place with the Lord God bless you and uh, I pray that 2024 will be a year of you walking into the direction of your marriage God bless you thank you praise God Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. What a word. She's preached everything I wanted to preach. <laughs> no, but no. well, that was really good. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jolami. Thank you, Dupsy. It's going to get better. I'm going to share my screen now because I believe that um just wanted to see. Let's see if I can get this. Yes. So if you are over 50 and you're in the house, save these dates in your calendar. It's the Saturday, the March, March 9th, 2024. We're going to be having a gathering online. It's a Saturday. It's the first Saturday in March. I think it's the first or second. I'm not sure now. I think it's second. We're going to be gathering. If you're 50 and up, I'm inviting you to this session. One of our leaders who lives in the U.S. is going to be speaking to us. She's walked this journey. She knows what your challenges are. She's going to tell you how she landed hers and what pitfalls to look out for. Please save those days in your calendar. Don't forget, our next event is on the 10th of February, 2024. 2024, 10th of February, Love Extravaganza. It's an unmissable event. Our speaker is, I mean, she's off the chain. You do not want to miss these two events. Also, Friday, coming Friday, is our congratulations prayers. I think we did this all throughout 2023, except for the month of December. We prayed every third Friday. Jolami said something that was really vital. He spoke about consistency. I found out that when you're con anything you're consist consistent with is what you get in harvest of. If you're consistent in your prayer life, you get a, the harvest of answered prayers. Don't pray once and just leave it. Don't pray three times consistency in your prayers. Dipsy said something. When you're looking for work, you don't only send out one resume. It's a cold resume here. It's called resume or CV. You don't send, you send, you send out several CVs to many companies. So you are consistent in looking for the work. You are consistent in your prayer life. You also have a form of social life. I know that's tricky with COVID, but go to church, go to gatherings, Meet up with your friends. Be nice to people, both single and married. And I'll talk about that in my session. Don't only hang out with your single friends because your single friends, they probably will not know who your husband is. The person that will probably introduce you to your husband is already married or your wife because it's both. So hang out with both. Hang out with married people. Hang out with single people. Go to church. Don't stay at home. Go to Christian events. If somebody invites you somewhere, go. Please do not be antisocial in 2024. So save the dates. Friday next week, we're going to pray. I know a lot more people turn out to pray for than these meetings, but it's fine. It's fine. Congratulations on Friday. I look forward to praying with you at 9 p.m. on Friday. Save that in your calendar. And Love Extravaganza is on the 10th of February, 2024. 
save that in your calendar as well. It's on our website. Please do see, please put our website on um on the Teams chat. Please don't forget. Go to our website, all the events are on there. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's just my name, Fumi QJ. Look for the YouTube channel and subscribe as well. And then 50 plus hangout is on March the 9th. Those are the three key events that you need to be aware of. We have an event also on March. I think it's March the 24th. We bring out the advert. You'll have the advert next, probably on Friday or next time we meet. Okay, that's me done. Hallelujah. I'm not sure if Pastor D is there already. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, while we wait for him, is anybody bold enough to come off camera and tell us what they're expecting from God in 2024? Anybody bold enough to come on camera? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Or should I pick one person? Oh, is there anybody on camera already who wants to have a conversation? Okay, do it. Go for it. Please go for it. Okay. While we wait for a bold person to come online, I'm just going to do a quick icebreaker here. And um, for some of you who are familiar with our um, program, we like to share um, life stories and give you an opportunity to reflect on this relationship and let us know if you think there's a red flag or maybe the challenges they're facing is just a sin is just um, a temporary obstacle. So I'm going to read one for you. And uh, please feel free to write in the chat if you think this is a red flag, thumbs up, or red flag. And if you think this is a, I'm sorry, if it's a red flag, th thumbs down, of course. And if it's a temporary obstacle, just let me know if it's a temporary obstacle um, with a thumbs up. So this is the scenario. These Christian couple are dating long distance. They're dating long distance. Um, he's a policeman living in Yukon in Canada. And uh, it's a remote and coldest part of Canada, which, however, she's a medical doctor from the US and she trained as a brain surgeon. So she's actually highly qualified. And um, they have been dating long distance and he proposed. During the engagement, he announced he's given up his job as a policeman to become a local pastor of a tiny church in Yukon in Canada. And uh, in doing that, he felt the calling of God. And in doing that, um, his earnings will be limited, obviously, and she would have to relocate for feed her medical practice in the U.S., and um, come and join him. However, because it's a remote village where they're going to be living, she will not be able to be a licensed doctor when she joins him in that part of Canada. But um, she, he has proposed now and she's now thinking about it. Is this a red flag or a temporary obstacle? Please let me know in the chat. They've been dating long distance and the, the relationship is thriving. First of all, she has to relocate. Secondly, she has to give up. She has to give up a career. And thirdly, she's living from a well-established um, job in the US and now moving to a tiny little village in Canada. Red flag or temporary obstacle? Okay, I see a lot of temporary obstacles, just one red flag. Thank you very much for your response. And uh, you are right. It is a temporary obstacle. Sometimes when our, our spouses do come, it may look very good. And then there's one challenge there that um, could throw you off. With this relationship, the lady knew that this was the right man for her. And so she did make the decision to give up her practice and move to Canada. They are married, they're flourishing. It turned out that in that remote place, they actually needed um, a doctor. And so the government helped her to get her license to practice in Canada. 
and um, she became the local um, um, GP for the community and uh, the church grew and they are thriving in their relationship. So sometimes challenges in the beginning does not necessarily mean it's not the right decision to make. We just have to trust God and move on in faith. Thank you very much for participating and I'll pass it back to Fumi. Thank you. That was quite practical. Quite practical, which is what we're here for. Bounce your questions by us. I think you should put some questions in the chat now so we can have some dialogue afterwards. Questions, things that you're unsure of, you know, please just keep popping them into the chat and we're going to have some Q&A time. Just before we finish tonight. Happy, happy raised her hand. She wanted to say something. Oh, I'm so sorry. Abby, can you say something, please? Please unmute yourself and go for it. Oh, hello. Good evening, everybody. Hello, um, Abby. Yeah, um, this is my first time here. My friend invited me. Thank you, Lolia. Um, I just, you were saying what's our expectation for the year. And for myself, um, I've been believing God, seriously awakening in God. And believing God that, you know, this 2024 is my year. And I'm repositioning myself. And um, the previous um, speaker covered a lot of stuff that I've been working on, on myself as well. Yeah. And, and I'm expecting for God to, you know, be my partner. And that we both have similar vision uh, on the same page, obviously. We have the same, is my same tribe kind of man, you know. I do not want to compromise because in this day and age, it's very hard for singles, you know, people compromising their standards, uh, compromising their values. And for you to be like, no, I'm not going to sleep with you. I'm not, I'm not going to compromise my standards. I'm, I'm going to stay. And I'm going to wait on God. It, it's not a popular thing. And obviously, yes, there will be heartbreak. And yes, there will be disappointment. And yes, people walk out and you know, be like, I'm not interested. But I've, I've held on to God. And I believe that, you know, that's not for me. And I know God is not a man that should lie. So I... Yes, yes. I, that's right. Just, believe in God that this year is my year and that yes. God will position into my life specifically people that will channel me and will give me that encouragement that yeah I'll be going you're walking the right path don't give up continue to be an inspiration to other people looking up to you as well it's, yeah. it's a lonely it's a lonely walk and it, it is difficult but mm. You know, I try to encourage myself and also encourage other friends as well. That you know, they're like happy. No, I can't do this. You know, I'm. I wanna give up. I wanna. I, I need a donor. I need to do this. You know, my head. I need to. I mean, all kinds of suggestions. People come up with these things, and I say to them, listen. If God is not a man that should lie, when is your time? I believe everything will work out. We today we're hearing women in their fifties, sixties giving birth, sixty-five year old giving birth to four triplets. So I mean, there's yeah, nothing that's what we, be, we believe God with you, Abi. Believe God, and we're gonna have some time to talk afterwards. We really believe God with you. Dupti and I got married into our forties. I I had a child when I was nearly fifty years old. So we believe God for you. And we're going to be taking time for questions. It's just that we want to try and keep to time. So hold your hold your question. Excellent contribution. We agree with you. You stand in faith. In 2024, this is your year. The Amen. people that don't receive are the people that give up. As long as you don't give up, you'll get it. Just keep standing. Dig your heels in and don't compromise. That's what Dupsy and I always tell you on this platform. Now, any woman that comes to, to this platform will probably tell you the same. Don't. If you sleep with a man, he will not marry you. There's no point. Why will I want to buy the cow when I can get the milk for free? Anyway, I'm not going to take some more time. But I'm going to come back to your question. We're going to circle back to that. We have Q&A after. Please keep dropping your questions in the chat. 
I think I saw Pastor D. Go for it, man of God. Hello. You're looking Hello. sharp. Well, How you know, you 2024, you got to leave up. Be sharp, guys. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for, oh, let me start by saying Happy New Year. Since this is our first gathering in 2024, thank you once again for being on the platform today. It's uh, it's great to have you. I have uh, been given, like all the other speakers, uh, the privilege of speaking on marital intelligence, marital intelligence. Uh, briefly, I'm going to run through it, one or two things, very practical session, and I hope you get something out of it. Amen. When you talk about marital intelligence, what are we talking about? What are we talking about? See, getting married is nothing but, in my opinion, is the beginning of the journey. Getting married it's like what they say, a foot in the door. It's the beginning of the journey. It's the, the starting point. The question that should occupy your mind then is, are you going to go, are you going in into, through this door? Are you staying in or just are you just holding the door for somebody else? And while that question may seem odd, just give me time and we'll go through this so that you can understand where I'm coming from. Because when we talk about marital intelligence, it's just like every other applicability of intelligence, like emotional intelligence and this intelligence and that intelligence. Marital intelligence is more than you just getting married. It's about you getting married. It's about you staying married. It's about you being happy in that marriage. It's about you experiencing an enduring, long-lasting marriage, what will it require? What is needed for you to do that? The Bible says wisdom is like a well in the heart of man and a person of understanding will draw it out. And so like most things in life, the Bible has the answer that we're looking for tonight concerning what we're talking about. Because at the end of the day, being married, getting married, which, like I said, is the beginning. That's a blueprint. That's an It's like an architectural drawing. It's an opportunity for you and your spouse to start building something. But you see, what you build is not as important as how you build it, what process you take, and what the end result is. In the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 23 from verse 3 to verse 6. Proverbs 23, 3 to 6 says, Through wisdom, a house is built. And by understanding, it is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all pressures and pleasant riches. A wise man is strong. Yes, a man of knowledge increases strength. For by wise counsel, you will wage your own war, and in a multitude of counsel, there is safety. What am I saying? Marital intelligence is the difference between you making a house or building a home. Marital intelligence is the difference. It's what will differentiate whether you end up with a house or you went, end up with a home. Now, you may be wondering, what's the difference? A house is just a structure. It's a brick and mortar. It's a contractual agreement. It's a place where all you do there is eat and sleep. A home, on the other hand, is a resting place. Unfortunately, most marriages these days are, are busy building houses rather than building homes. A home is a resting place. It's a place where you find rest. It's a place where you find peace. It's a place where you, you live in an environment and in an, an atmosphere that is real, where you can just be yourself and, and just be relaxed. Like the Bible says that the two of them were naked and unashamed. The, a home is a place where you are you. And in order to build a home, you need 
marital intelligence. Because anybody can build a house. Anybody can start a relationship. Anybody can get married. Anybody can have a boyfriend or a girlfriend and an engagement and a lavish wedding and all of that. The question is, what happens after you said I do? It takes wisdom. It takes knowledge. It takes understanding. It takes strength and good counsel to not just build, but to have and to keep a home. And that is what marital intelligence is about. So how do you develop marital intelligence? Simply put, the first thing you need to do, the first thing you need to, to, to acquire, the first ingredient in your building marital intelligence is to have knowledge. Have knowledge of what it means to be married. But what is knowledge? Knowledge is the acquisition and the processing of data and information regarding anything or any situation. Knowledge is the data that you collect, is the information that you assemble. It is the combination of all these facts and figures that you put together about something, about a situation. But you see, having knowledge alone is, it will not give you the result. When it comes to marriage, knowledge, the gathering of knowledge is more than the goose pimples or the sweaty palms or the knocking of your knees or when you heard his name or you heard her voice on the phone, your, your heart just leaped. No. Once you know his name, you know where he works, you know where she's from and the name of her family and the church that they go to. What else do you know about this person? Is everything you know about this person, is it limited to what they have told you? Or have you invested yourself in learning, in discovering, in gathering all the necessary data about the things, especially those things they haven't told you about, or they're not telling you about, or they're not willing to tell you about? Have you spent time with their friends or their family and making them know, that, making it clear to them that, look, this is not a social gathering. I'm on a fact-finding mission. I just want to know as much as possible about this person so I can position myself as a better partner to them. Do you, do they have any personal goals that they have shared with you? Any personal development or the things, the vision they have for their lives? Have they shared that with you? And have you just taken that as their vision, as their goal? Or have you, have you opened it up to see where do I belong in this? How do I, where, where, where's my place in this hope, goal, and vision thingy? In order for you to gather all this knowledge and these facts and this data, when was the last time you want to be married? We believe in God for marriage and married to destinies to manifest. When was the last time you took yourself to a library or a bookshop or somewhere online to read about the peculiarities of the opposite sex? Not so that you can know how to get one over them. No, it's for you to gain the general knowledge and the intelligence that is required for you to keep a home. Marital intelligence is your data being gathered. It's the information that you've collected. It's when you then process them and meditate on them and you turn them over, you, 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 you chew it, you, you think about it, you write it down and it begins to form an image. It begins to form a pattern. You begin to develop your own guidelines as far as your relationship is concerned, because that is what will equip you to have a marital bliss, blissfulness. So the first thing you must do, the first requirement for you to be certified as somebody with marital intelligence is gather all the information. 
pull all the data together, bring them together, and, and just learn as much as possible. Not just about what they ate last night and what they're going to do on Saturday. Number two, you got the data. Now you need to gain some wisdom. You need to gain some wisdom. Because wisdom is not just the data you go. Wisdom is you knowing the how and the application of the data once you have processed it. Now you've got the data. Now you've put it together. Now you've processed it. What do I do with this? How do I apply this in this situation? When this happens, how do I respond? How do I re relate to this person? How do I handle situation? If this is what is going to happen tomorrow, how do I prepare for it? All of that will come from the data you've gathered. Now you've processed it. Now you're get, gaining wisdom from the process data. Because many well laid out plans, they fail at the point of execution. Because sometimes people just assume that because they have the data, then it means they have the answer. No, just having the data is not enough. Just gathering the information is not enough. You must process that. You must dilute it. Sorry, you must diffuse it into nugget size so you can then begin to apply them. And that is the demonstration of wisdom. Many issues that a lot of people have, especially in their relationships, in their marriage, in their friendship, they are not serious issues. They are not life-threatening issues. They are not even issues that could be a deal breaker. The only challenge is, in most cases, people focus on the symptoms rather than dealing with the root. They respond in a, in a, they say the wrong thing at the right time or the right thing at the wrong time. And what that does is it fuels the disagreement rather than to quench it. For instance, you know your, your spouse or your partner or your boyfriend or, or your girlfriend they're not in their best mood when their football team has just lost a match. That's not the time to start talking to them about, well, you know that wedding plan. They are not in a place to talk about your wedding plan at that time. She's just come back from the salon and her face is pulled tight in and, and she's growling because her expensive Brazilian 100% human, human hair wig has just been damaged. And now you want to talk to her about, when are we going to go and see my mother? No, choose your time. Apply wisdom. You've gathered the information. You know how they, they in this type of environment, in this type of situation, you know how they relate. Apply that wisdom. That's how you build a home. That's how you apply marital intelligence to your life. Number three, by knowledge, by understanding, through wisdom, build every precious space in that relationship with pleasant riches, with long lasting memories, with things that they will remember, even while they're crying, they'll be smiling. Fill each aspect of that home with precious, pleasant riches of good memories. They make a determination to leave a long-lasting memory in various aspects of that home that you are building, of that relationship that you have, of that connection that you, you are you that that you have. Because the truth is, we've all been beaten up by life through one thing or another. But when you apply wisdom, you leave nuggets in their parts. You leave pleasant memories in different aspects. And so even while they are being beaten down and being slapped over by life, they bump into that note that you left. They remember what you said yesterday. They remember how you let, make them feel last week. And suddenly, there's a smile on their faces. 
because the reality is rough time will come in every relationship, especially in marriages. Times will come where you ask yourself, what on earth was I thinking about? But you see, it is those pleasant memories, those good tastes that you've left in their mouth, those excellent, wonderful deeds that you've deposited that will carry them, that will balance out the negativity of life that they're dealing with. That's how you build a home, and that's how you apply marital intelligence. Number four. The passage we read said, wage your own war. Wage your own war. How? Apply godly counsel. In every relationship, there will be good times, there will be bad times, and there will be indifferent times. But you see, marital intelligence is your ability to recognize the season that you are in at time. And the wisdom from marital intelligence is you knowing how to adapt accordingly to that season. Is it the good season? You know what to do. Is it the bad season? You know what to do. Is it the in-between season? You know what to do. The ability to recognize and adapt based on the situation of that you're dealing with, that ability is, a, is determined by the quality of the godly counsel that has already been deposited in you. Where are you getting your counsel from? Who told you that that's what you do in a marriage? Why did you believe that there's nothing good about men? There are no two marriages that are exactly the same. But marriage is guarded and it's built on basic principles and guidelines. And it is your responsibility as part of your marital intelligence to gather, to know those principles, to, 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 to build yourself up with godly counsel from godly places like this platform, the single but not satisfied. Because what works for your parents will not, in most cases, work in your own marriage. What works for your cousin will not apply to you. You must know who you are, what you are, where you are, how you are, and with whom you are sharing life and apply the, the, the counsel, the godly counsel that you have received in every situation. Because godly counsel, they are key ingredients. They are the bricks that build life and marriages and relationships. Don't base your, your actions and your decisions on that popular saying that somebody said in the pub or, or what is shared. In, so that lady was talking about in the salon. If that was me, no, that weren't you. So, shush. Don't let ungodly counsel shipwreck your relationship and your marriage. Gain marital intelligence because there are dangers, there are troubles, there are issues lurking in every turn and in every bend of life, especially where two people are together in a relationship. But you see, the antidote is to gather and take heed of godly and sound counsel so that in the time of trouble, while the wind is blowing, while the earthquake is shaking, while the fire is raging, you'll be able to withstand and still come out victorious because you are standing on the solid rock, which is the word of God. As I close, the Bible says if, if you faint in the time of trouble, it's because your strength is small. So what's the way of gain strength? Steady your stand. Bulletproof your relationship and your marriage by acquiring and applying these marital intelligence nuggets. And you will thank me for it next week. Thank you. God bless you. What else is there to say? <laughs>
Wow, thank you so very much, sir. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for coming again. Um, I know you're super busy. We're only I'm only going to be talking for about 10 minutes, then we'll start taking questions and answers, um, questions and answering it because I think we've gone past our time already. Um, I've been I've had the privilege of speaking to quite a few women that are getting married 2024, some of them from this platform. And um, so I'm I'm acting like your coach mainly because most of you are you've now seen the guys or your your you've seen opportunities and you just want to close the deal one two three what do I do, you know I'm just going to say a few things thank you Pastor D thank you um Dupsi thank you um Jolomi thank you for everything that you've said some of them are, I mean everything you said is just so spot on, you know one of the things I wanted to say is many of us have romantic ideas in our heart of what a marriage should be like. I was saying to somebody this, this this past week that one of the worst things that happened to most, especially for the girls, not so much for the boys, I know some of the boys read it, is, is Mills and Boone, those books and those those romantic novels that we read when we were growing up. You know, the guys in the, the guy tall, dark, handsome, has a, is a provider, excellent job, wealthy, nice car, and the woman falls in love with him and he has six pack and they live happily ever after for after falling in love. Well, those things only happen in those books. Most often than not, it don't, will not happen to you like that. So I want you, one of the things, if you're writing notes, number one, divorce yourself from all your, all your, all your romantic novels and romantic comedies, rom-coms you've watched on online or, or on the TV. It's not always like that. The wedding is just one day. Don't spend all your time thinking about fantasizing about my wedding dress, my wedding hair, my, you know, it's just, in fact, it's seven hours. It's not even seven days. In seven hours, you're done. The whole wedding is done. So you're there dreaming, building, trying to, to think about your flower girls, your, 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 your bouquet, the hall, the bridesmaid. All those things are nice, but it's just for seven hours. Focusing all your energy and all the attention on the wedding without thinking, like Mr. D said, on this long-term marathon is a deception. Hallelujah. Number two, your marriage is for assignment. Marriage is not just, you know, hold my hand, go on holiday, that, that, that. It's good. All those things are good. But Dipsy said one thing, seek first God's kingdom. God is passionate about his kingdom. God wants to advance his kingdom, especially now that we're closer to the end of the age. What exactly do you think your marriage should be about? It should be about advancing the kingdom. So when you have that mindset, it's easy for God to release your provision for you because he knows oh, this one, they will celebrate me in their relationship. This one will bring many to the Lord. This one will work as a, as a team together to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number two, what is your motive for marriage? One of the reasons many marriages are delayed is because people are, have a selfish reason for wanting to marry. Just me and my husband, we go on a cruise, enjoy ourselves. It's not the primary reason God has made a relationship. It's not good for a man to be alone. I'll make him a help meet for him. And then he gives them an assignment, subdue the earth, replenish the earth. God wants us to enjoy but the, the replenishing and the dominion and building his kingdom is key. He wants us to depopulate hell and populate heaven. Christianity is about the liberty of men. So when you get married, that focus should be on your mind. If your focus is to show up to other people that finally landed, I have a diamond ring and this, you know, God's agenda is more important than that. Hallelujah. So if you want to marry and stay married, the kingdom must be a focus. If not, you, the tendency is that you will lose focus. And when the focus is lost, there's tendency for division because you are no longer have a combined focus. You are not thinking on what is important. Hallelujah. Number three, when what I'm talking about today is, are you really ready? I'm asking you a lot of questions. Are you really ready? Are you mentally and emotionally ready? I know every speaker has said that before. Marriage can be tough if you're not ready. I like what Pastor D said. You need to get all the knowledge. Hang out with married people. Talk to married people. Especially people that you know, I want your, my marriage to be like your own. 
and have the privilege of talking to a lot of mature singles and they think because they're in their 50s or 40s or 60s, they are ready. They are not ready. Marriage is not about you anymore. Somebody else will be in your place, be in your space all the time. Use your kitchen, use your bathroom, be in your bedroom. They may not always do it the way you want it done. You may not always be in control of everything. Many want to marry, but they don't want to change. You want to marry, but you don't really want to adapt. You want to marry, but you don't really want to fit in without any, you want to fit without any change. Let him just come and I continue to live the way I am. It can't work. Marriage is about change. If you think you will marry and you will not change, it's ignorance. It's ignorance on rampage. It's not going to happen. Marriage means you are selfless. Selfish people do not last in marriage. It's a matter of time. One of them will walk. Marriage is about making room. It's about not just about me, but about you. I want what the other person wants. I will want to please you. It's not just about you. You have to factor in the other person. Your spouse may have a family. Gypsy said that. They, they may have children. They may have, you may need to adapt with in-laws, stepchildren. And then he said outlaws. There has to be a mind shift. There's somebody else I need to adjust to. This person will be in my face all the time. It will be in your room, in your living room. It will use your kitchen utensils. Some of you, it must be this way. I want it this way. My fork must stay here. My spoon, my this. It's not just about that anymore. It's not just, he will use your microwave, your cooker, mess up your kitchen. I'm talking about the reverse now. I'm talking about this to the ladies. What's going to happen? Some of us need to pray that God will help you, especially if you're a clean freak. What's going to happen? I tell you one thing, it's easier to marry than to stay married. It's tougher to, to stay married because there's a lot that needs to go. And this is where we're going to be praying into it specifically on Friday. Another thing is, another question for me today is, are you accountable? Gypsy said that, so I won't go on and on about that. Couples that are accountable to other people will always succeed. When you are isolated, you will suffer in silence. And often, by the time the rescue comes, it's too late. You need to have other couples that you hang out with, that you bounce stuff by, that you laugh with, that you run things by. You need accountability partners, somebody that you can call when somebody's tripping. Anyone that cannot be corrected is a ticking time bomb. Anybody that nobody can talk to. This man on this platform, no one, and this lady on this platform, they know when they pick the phone and talk to me and sit down and listen. You need to talk to people who are not too scared of you. People who are objective and have an aerial view. You need to sort because sometimes you surround your, your, ourselves with people who are yes people. So they're too scared of you to tell you to change. I'm not going to go too much about this because my, I think the only main thing was about character adjustment. There is always an area of improvement. We are all work in progress. There's always something about your life that can be better. One of the things I do every year now for about 10 years is I take, I do a SWOT analysis of my life. I take an audit, Holy Spirit, take an audit of my life. What can I do better? What areas can I adjust in? Am I opinionated? Do I like to have my own way? Do people walk on eggshells around me? This one is key. Are you temperamental? Are you touchy? Do you have a short fuse? I remember I was saying to somebody, one of my younger friends last week, about how my pastor in Canada corrected me. And said, I have to tell you this. You have to stop being touchy. Oh my God. Oh my God. But thank God I love that man for that. Now, I didn't see it then. I thought, oh, maybe it wasn't critical. But that singular statement, it helps me motivate my life every time. When I want to de default in that direction, I'm quickly able to recover myself. I'm not touchy. I'm even tempered. Love, joy, peace. Patience, all these things are at work in me. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Ask the Holy Spirit to take an audit of your life. Which character in life is not part of the fruits of the Spirit? Outburst of hunger, easily offended. The last man of God said something. There are there, there are one of the things, and I'm talking specifically to the women now. The Bible says a soft answer turns away wrath. That's that's 
men, when a man talks and a woman talks in a relationship, the woman is the regulator. The person that told me that I didn't like her when I was getting married, I thought, ah, what nonsense. She's putting a lot of the responsibility on the woman. And then she showed me in the Bible, Proverbs 31, in our tongue is the law of kindness. Pastor D and Jolomi will attest to D. I think I'm not sure one meeting he said, and a woman, a girl, a lady who actually has been married, she used to be on this platform, she's now married now, met me in the church and said, I am now married. And this is the reason I'm married. I came to one of your meetings. You said in every man there is a king and a fool. Whoever you address will come out. So from then I knew that I had to watch myself because the area I fall down most is my tongue. I tend to speak out of turn. Now she's married. And that brings me back to say this. Please, I don't want to meet you in the... Uh, I keep meeting people and say, oh, I'm now getting married. I'm now getting married because I came to your meeting. Tell us. Email us. You may, we may, I know some of you don't want to come and give your testimony. But just write it down. We'll read it. But I mean, I go to... I was telling this to my, 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 my other ministers that I go to meetings and I meet ladies. Oh, I'm getting married because of you. It's exciting. I'm very excited for you. But you have to come and bless the other people so that they will be encouraged. Hallelujah. I'm nearly done now. One more point. Avoid a critical spirit. This is especially, this is for everybody. You may want to correct but, and get your wife or your husband to align, but nobody likes to be corrected. I have a young son. Even when you correct him, because we all think we are, we are the best thing since sliced bread. Ephesians 4, 15 says we should speak the truth, but the last two letters there says, speak the truth, two words, in love. Anytime you speak the truth and the other person gets offended or angry, it's because we didn't do it in love. There is a way that you can love somebody to change. And, and this, I'm on this journey as well. That you can love somebody to, 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 to you can correct somebody and the person will not take offense. Sometimes people misinterpret, especially the woman to the man. I'm talking from a woman's perspective now. A man can often interpret it when you want to correct him as control. It can be categorized as manipulative. So my idea is stick to Ephesians 4.15. Always speak the truth to people in love. Protect the peace in your home. Be a champion of peace. We always know when the conversation is not going in the right direction zip it. Know when your conversation is going to trigger an ag argument. Don't keep going on and pressing and on. Actually, I think those things are not normal, but that's, that's, that's another class. Okay? So that's the questions I have for us today. Praise God. Before we go into the questions, I know we've, we've gone past our time. If you need to jump off, we understand. God bless you. Don't forget, we will be meeting again February 10, if you need to jump off, God bless you. But now we have to take the questions. Thank you so much again for attending. Hallelujah. God bless you. And we'll see you again on February 10th if you need to jump off. If you can't connect with us, prayers is on Friday. We we'll look forward to praying with you. Now we go into the Q&A session. I think somebody wanted to see the um, the flyer for the prayer. Please, if you could share. Thank oh, you. Okay, I'll share it before we finish again. Yes, both um, flyers, please. Okay. Share just give me some time. Let's go into questions. Please add your questions to the chat. And um, if you do want to ask a question directly, just let us know and we would ask you to unmute and we'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. I think we have one already, but I'll wait for you to share the flyers and then we'll go ahead. please feel free to take a picture if you need to take a picture so you can um, note all the times or this video will be on the on the youtube channel 
by tomorrow, I expect. So you can also come yes. back and watch the video and you will see all the um, information that you need. Thank you very much. Also be on our website. Um, if they're not there, um, it should be there in the next couple of days for sure. So you can always visit our website, which will um, also provide you with a link to access the videos um, on YouTube directly. So that, that should help. Excellent. And the website is singlebutnotsatisfied.co.uk. Thank you. So I'm going to go to the first question. And I'll read it directly from the chat. Please just bear with me. Okay. So this is the question. Um, my question is, even though we, we talk about adjustments, why does it appear it is the women expected to make a lot of adjustments and the men appear more self? <laughs> I'll let you let me start with that. Yeah, let could... me start with it. Can <laughs> <laughs> we uh, read um, the flyer, please? Thank you. I can assure you that it's not that um, men equally need just as much um, adjustments and corrections. It's, I, I think, to be honest, it's 50-50. I really don't think that um, the burden is, is being placed on on the ladies, um, I think it's 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 more or less equal. And if I want to be a bit more biased, I'll probably say that more uh, a, a lot more is, is actually placed on the on the men than the women. Because when things go wrong, even if the woman is at fault, they will, they will turn to the man and ask, "What happened there? What do you do?" <laughs> so um, it, it it but there are um, issues that are quite regular and quite um, fundamental that, that sometimes um, the, the, the women can help. But I wouldn't say by, by any stretch of the imagination that there's more burden on, on, on the women than there is for the men. That, that, that wouldn't be correct. Okay. Lucy, do you want to add to that before I... Yes, I can add to that. I think statistically speaking, we are aware that there are a lot more women that would attend, for example, a program like this, and which is why Fumi typically addresses, you know, this character of flaws amongst women because we have more women on our platform. So it's not necessarily because um, the burden is on the women and not the men. And so um, we like to share our experiences and also to share some of the nuggets of truths that would help us as women. But um, with men, they also have their own um, side to play. They have their side to play. But one of the things that Fumi talked about that is typically a challenge to us women is, you know, speaking the truth in love, you know, and especially when we're mature women, you know, many of you are in um, uh, positions of authority in your businesses or in your office. Many of you have staff that you can talk to in a more, you know, superior fashion, and that's fine in the workplace. We all do that. But when it comes to marriage, there is a place that God has placed us on. And there are some characteristics that we need to be mindful of, you know. So that is why um, it appears as though we have to make the adjustment. And uh, so I wouldn't say too much from that. Thank you. I, I'm going to add just a little bit more to that by saying, by by the very nature of what the, the, the uh, ministry that we, we have, um, a lot of the ladies here have had the privilege of speaking to other ladies and hearing details of what's happened to them, and and from just from that alone, they are, they are able to come and you know give advice based on real hard facts, and and a lot of this do come from women, and that's why sometimes we are not just speaking from the top of our head, but speaking from um, not only experiences but things that we have heard personally. From other um, from other women and uh, and men um, as well, but predominantly um, a lot of them do come from women, and we do try to uh, speak candidly uh, about um, the different scenarios that we've heard and the advice or counsel that's been given um, to those particular scenarios. And I can add to that too. We do have um, 
friends, um, some single men friends that, you know, we talk to from time to time. And it's interesting, some of the little things, little mistakes that women do that turns them away. And many of those things come from their character. Oh, that's 90% of the time is that character. So if they're talking to us about the particular woman that maybe I know, and I know that, oh, she's such a lovely girl and da, 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 da. I don't know what character she showed in front of that guy that turned him off. Oh. Um, we just need to be mindful of how we behave because we can miss our blessings, not because yes. God has given you a blessing, yes. but because you have not been mindful of portraying yourself in the right in the right place in order to retain that relationship. And just to buttress what you said, Dipsy, that was you and let me just just put on. I mean, I meet girls that say I have to say everything in my heart. That's just my nature. I just have to say it. You know, that's not. I don't want to say that's not a very good. That's not. I, I, I could use a stronger word, but I'm going to be really kind. That's not a very good nature. Even the Bible says a fool says everything that is in his heart. Mm. You know, you can't, you have to measure what you say. You have to look at the person you are talking to. Would you say that to your boss at work, for example? Would you talk say like that to your CEO when you get to work? You probably won't. If you got on the, if you had a chance of having dinner with your with the president of your company, would you say everything in your heart? Will you even talk about your boss recklessly? No. You know, and you may say, oh, this is different, this is my husband. Your husband or your wife or your partner or your spouse or your boyfriend is very human, you know? And on this platform, I thank God for Pastor D, I think he's have to drop off now, and Jolomi. I have always known that he, Pastor D mentioned about reading and reading and reading, and that's when I'm, I'm in my library now and my books are all behind me. And one of the things I found out, what a man wants is different from what a woman wants. A woman wants to be loved. A woman is passionate. A woman is emotional. She's, she's all those romantic comedies are for us. We love it. But that, do you know a man doesn't really, you don't need to love a man. Did you know that? For a woman, you don't need to. It's not so important to him if you send him flowers or not. The important thing for a man is to respect him. If you respect a man, you eat, he will eat out of your hands. And I did a research, I, I think I shared it with Dupsy, where I found out the guys, the men in places of authority, and there was one big scandal in England very recently about that, men in places of authority, the women they date or the women they, they commit adultery with are not necessarily women in their league. No, they are women that are way below them that if you saw them, you would say, but I know his wife, his wife is so, so, so. But because that person defers to them, that person respects them, that person reverses them, a man gravitates towards that. Aha, since the day I learned that, it was easy for me. So that's, those are the kind of things when you meet your, when you meet a guy, you know, even though you want to slap him sometimes, I mean, it's natural. You want to just slap this guy, you slap some sense, you know, you just learn to zip your mouth. Don't say everything yet. Don't say, I just have to talk. I just have to talk. No, you don't have to talk. You can walk away and calm down and then come back and have a reasonable conversation. You know, don't talk when you are angry. I had to learn that the hard way because words are like eggs. Once it drops, you cannot pick it up again. Don't say stupid stuff when you're angry that you can just say, I was just angry. It's too late. It's too late. That thing is recorded for life. You know, so... I remember saying this to a chap who I thought was a potential about 20 odd years ago. He was talking so much and I said, oh, just keep quiet. That thing I said, he probably told five people that's the reason he didn't marry me. That one singular thing, Dupsy knows the person. That one singular thing. I just said, ah, shut up, you are talk too much, keep quiet. So watch what you say, watch how you say it. Carry yourself right. Oopsie, unless Jolami wants to add something. I'm done. Um, just, just one more, just a little thing. I, I, have, a, I have a friend in, um, should, should I mention where? <laughs> um, in Switzerland. And um, he, he, went through a, um, he went through a divorce. And um, he, I was chatting with him at one point and he was, was looking to get married. I mean, like he wanted to get married, you know. 
So when women say, oh, we are the guys, there's no people out there. There are some guys out there who are looking to get married specifically. And he was a typical example of that. And he ended up marrying someone um, back in Nigeria because he thought it was safer. You know, uh, because all the, all, the, all the girls he met in Europe, where he, he just, he, could, he couldn't write a letter home for them. He went out and got married to this girl, and sadly for him, he had a bad experience. And I'm thinking, goodness me, this is a guy who is looking to get married, who you know has everything you might think you might want from 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 a guy, and and then he has the misfortune of picking somebody who just tried to use him, mm -hmm. and uh, it's really sad. And he's filed for divorce a second time, just to say. There are guys out there who are looking to get married. Yes. Good. Thank I have you. something to say on that one, but I won't say it now. <laughs> you see, you see, do you want to go? Because right, he's, we... he's the common denominator. This is the second time around. <laughs> you, know, you, so you need to hear the full story. Full story. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We always have a laugh when we're together. Sorry, guys. I see someone say in the chat, where are these men? Very yeah, good. honestly, there are men there. There are men up there, good men, good men. Like I said, with your prayers, hang out with people, especially married, your married women friends, up to them. They will probably know somebody who will know somebody who will know somebody who will connect you to somebody. Don't say they're not there. And if somebody, I have to say this, sorry, that I'm hijacking this again, Dupsy. If Go somebody ahead. introduces you to some somebody, somebody says, I know somebody, please, please, I repeat, please talk to the person before you say, no, it's not for me. Pick up the phone, let the person talk to you. Don't say, because it does not add up. I like what your opening statement. Don't judge a book by its cover. You've not even spoken to the person. You've written the person off. Speak to the person. Talk to the person. You have been waiting for 10 years. Somebody now finally shows up or introduces you. Don't say he's not my type. You've not spoken to him. How do you know? Sorry, John, I just have to put that in. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. We will circle back to that again. Um, okay. Please, again, um, add your questions into the chat. We're just... Um, answering the questions from the chat, or if you do want to speak to us directly, let us know. We'll let you unmute and uh, ask your question. There's a Is question this... here from TK. Yes, I'm, I'm going to read it in a second. Okay. What is the difference between adjusting yourself to accept your partner's characters or behavior and compromising your principles to accept their characters or behavior? Or is it a case of incompatibility that would over time eventually bring a huge strain on the marriage so, um, so i'll read it again what is the difference between adjusting yourself to accept your partner's character or behavior and yet compromising your principles in order to accept their character and behavior or is this a case of maybe it's incompatibility that would over time eventually bring a huge strain on the marriage. I'm going to pick up a couple of um, phrases there. Compromising your principles is not something you would want to do if your principles are aligned with the word of God. You, you're not going to compromise on that. So it, it won't be a question of your compromising um, your principles. Changing your character, if your character is wrong, uh, would only aid not only yourself but also help your relationship. So there's a difference there, and that's why when I was, I was talking, I'm, I'm saying you look in the mirror, you recognize um, the things that you might need to change um, that might be considered character flaws uh, for for other people. Those are the things that yes, you, you need to change. But compromising principles is, is something different from changing your character. And yes, if you don't change a bad habit or a bad character, then it would um, bring about incompatibility and yet it would have a huge strain on your marriage. But compromising principles is completely different. Yeah, I agree with what you said, Jolomi. 
I just wanted to add to that, you know, exactly what you said. Principles, is this spiritual principle, godly principles? What, what, what does the word of God say? But just to add to what you said, perfect answer. There is no two perfect people. There's no perfect persons in the world. We'll always be different. We have different backgrounds, different. But if the person, if you can get along with the person, have a friendship with the person, you probably will be able to live with the person. If you go for any other thing, a lot of times people break up because what attracted them to the person is superficial. The person's figure, the person's face, or the, the guy's six pack, the guy's car. It's, it's superficial. He has nothing concrete behind it. But if you base, especially as a mature single, you are not necessarily looking for butterflies anymore. You are looking for companionship, relationship, and a stable person. Not somebody who is up today, down tomorrow, emotional. You know, there's no perfect person, number one. So Ed, that's, put that in your back pocket. So somebody you will probably meet, if that person is a girl, will not be perfect. But there are people change, people adjust, especially when you pray for them. You will not, <laughs> don't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> the guy may come, I'm going to probably say that all day today, that was a good opening line, <laughs> you know, that that person can change. That person will change. People evolve, people change. This is not me when I got married to my husband. I've changed a lot. Oh my God, I have changed so much for the better. And he has, significantly and same with Dupsi and Jolomi when you got married you were not the same as you are now because we change every day as we behold him in the mirror we are changed from one glory to another there is a process of change every day every month every year don't be rigid and say it's only hard I must change or it's only him me I would I'm good because we always write our homework and mark it it's somebody else who has to judge whether you have changed or whether you are going there or whether you know, that's why you have to expose yourself to good friendships. Friendships of people that can tell you, ah, for me, you could do better. I don't know, what you did was not very good. Okay? Please, Lipsy, say something. Um, oh, concerning that, I think, you know, um, like Fumi had alluded to previously, um, our relationships, even outside of um, marriage, like relationships at work, relationships with friends, they all come with the same challenge. You know, you're dealing with people who have, you know, different characteristics from you and we all have to adapt. They have to adapt to you as well. Like uh -huh. you're not, you don't have the best character in some area, you know? And so because a guy is approaching you and is interested in you, he may have observed some of those characters in you that he's not quite happy with, you know, but he is willing to adjust to you. And so you also have to, you have to have the heart to say, okay, this character may not be a hundred percent what I'm looking for, but I'm willing to adapt. And like Fumi said, we all change in marriage. Again, as long as it's, out, it's not outside the principles of God. So if we look at it that way, then that's fine. So I'm going to read another question in the chat. And it says, if you like someone at church, should you wait for them to approach you? I don't know if this is a female or a male. I'm assuming it's a female. Definitely a female. <laughs> if you like someone at church, should you wait for them to approach you? I think I'm going to start with this one. <laughs> um, when you say wait for them, they don't even know you like them. So what are they waiting for? They have no idea. I think that's my first approach to that. If you like someone in church, there's nothing wrong in striking up a, a coming um, a, um, a dialogue. That's all it is when you start. You're just striking a dialogue. You're not telling them anything other than looking for an opportunity to dialogue with this person. Because many times- And find out about them. And find out about them. Because many times as women, you know, and um, I'm speaking because I'm, you know, I used to be single like mm -hmm. everybody else. Our emotions go way, way ahead of us for someone that we have no clue about. We don't know anything about him. So that um, love or whatever it is or like, not likeness or, or attraction that you have within that person, it's still very superficial because you don't know this person. 
You have no idea who they are. You may strike up a dialogue with them and in five minutes, poof, that <laughs> life find out who they are. It will be gone. <laughs> so why keep yourself in that position, holding on to this emotion, you know, that you know nothing about? It's for your own good to quickly strike up that, that conversation, know whether it's going forward or not, and move on. I know a lot of single people who will hold on to it for, for I mean, even yes. years, and they're still praying about this guy who has no clue who they are, you know, and it may just be superficial. So please, women, just save yourself the child, the, the child, the, the, trauma. <laughs> again, the turmoil, the trauma. The trauma. I, think, I think you see for women, for women, once a guy says hello, and it's somebody that you really like in your head, the guy may not like you. He may just be want to be a friend. You've started planning the wedding. You're practicing the signature. He hasn't even said anything, you know? So you're very spot on. Find out about him. Well, what does, what's he like? He may be married for all you know, you know? So just well, find at out. At the same time, also, I think one of the, um, one of the questions that women have is that, uh, or one of the fears is the fear of rejection. They don't want to try and talk to a guy and he brushes uh, off. I, I, and I completely understand that. But you have one thing in common that um, means that you you probably see him at least once a week. You, you both go to the same church. So it's not like you just randomly met him on the, on, the, on, on the train and you're hoping to meet him the next time. You know he's going to be in church um, next next Sunday. You can... You can plant yourself right next to him and sit next to him. He he has no idea anyway of who you are. And you might just sit, just sit next to him in, in the service, or you might just bump into him, like you know, drop something in front of him, say fix it up, whatever. There are more more ways than one to bury a cat. You know, you can be creative about it, and this could be your story of how you guys met. And this could be the story that you hang over him for the rest of his days. That this is how I hooked you, that you had no idea. Have some fun with it. Be imaginative. Be creative. You know, you don't have to just go up and say, hi, my name is X, Y, Z, what's your name? It doesn't have to be like that. There are more ways than one. You can get someone else to introduce you to him, maybe a common friend. There's so many ways of going about it. Like I said, you have one thing in common. You go to the same church, which means mm -hmm. at least you see him once a week, if he comes once a week. Okay. And I think if there's any concern about should a woman approach a man, you can. You can approach. You're not approaching him and proposing to him. You're just striking up a dialogue. He doesn't know anything about you. He doesn't even know that you care about him. You're just striking up a dialogue. So with that, it's okay. Okay, I'll go to the next question. Okay, um, I am on a WhatsApp singles group who are supposed to be Christians, but I'm put off meeting up with and hanging out with a group as they go to non-Christian events. Should I give it a try? Also, they don't appear to be guys. They don't, there doesn't appear to be guys there in my age range, which is early fifties. So I assume this is a lady She's in a Christian WhatsApp group of singles. There's more women than men, but they go to non-Christian events. Should she go with them? Excuse me. Yeah. Thank you. Jay. Um, well, I would say yes. I mean, you've thrown a few obstacles in there already. I mean, I always like it if you could, um, if there's gonna be a positive mindset. Um, about you know trying to do something different. Um, there's supposed to be a Christian um, uh, group. Well, they, they probably are, but you know outside of Christianity, there are there are still natural things that we have to do and you know think about. We, we go to movies, we have coffee, we have we, we have dinner, we have lunch. I won't say breakfast, but hey, um, and. In this case, you would um, seize the opportunity of striking up a friendship. It's not necessarily every time you go out with someone that is a relationship. It's a friendship. You hang out with people. We talk about things. 
Um, as regards to the age range, I, I don't understand if you are saying that they are too old or too young for you. And I'm a bit confused about, about that. For the age range, some people say age is a number. So, it, But it could be that you, are, you, you would probably go out with somebody who's older than you or somebody who's younger than you. That's not clear. But in any case, there's no harm in going out and having a good time for a laugh, you know. It's not because you are you, you you you're hoping that on, on that particular date you will uh, get um get, get, get too young and they oh, go to the nightclubs. Night it depends again on what what you mean by nightclubs. Is it nightclubs in terms of like um like a live band for for example, or is it just a place where there's music being played, or is it just a place where there's just loud music and there's no conversation? You know, mm -hmm. and then if you know that's that's the wrong group, well, you're doing the right things. You are going yes. to some group, find a different group. I'm sure there are other ones out there that will mm -hmm. suit um um the kind of thing that you might uh, be interested in, both with conversations. Okay, so you can have a conversation. That's good. Investigate. While going out there, you might meet somebody else who is not even in that group. All we are saying is that go out and mingle and have a conversation and meet new people every single time and every opportunity that you get. Because along the way, it might well be that you're getting on the bus to go down to this group and you meet somebody. We are saying, go out and mingle. And I'm gonna add to that. And that is, first of all, what you mean by non-Christian events. Um, you know, the Bible says we're not of this world, but we do live in this world. So events are events. Um, if you go to watch a movie, you know, that's a non-Christian um, event. And we do do that anyway with our friends, with our families, you know. So we need to also be careful not to overly spiritualize where we should be. Because you don't know where you're going to meet your spouse. You might meet your spouse in in a place that you never even thought, you know. So always at work, say, for example. At work is not a is not a Christian event, you know. Um, so what we're saying is, you know, allow yourself the opportunity as much as possible to be available. Your husband or your wife is somewhere, you know, and you're not going to stay at home. You're going to have to go out there and. Give yourself the opportunity to be found. That's all we're saying. And because you go to an environment where they're all non-Christians, you will be surprised. Maybe one non-Christian guy decided to bring his Christian brother that day who didn't even want to go there anyway. And you happen to be there. You know, God knows that you're looking for a Christian man. Obviously, put your guards up. You know where your boundaries are in terms of your Christian beliefs. But it doesn't mean you can't go anywhere because you just don't know where the Lord has your portion for you. And don't always believe that when you go somewhere, your spouse is there. Maybe the person who knows your spouse is there. That's what you also have to remember. The person who knows your spouse is there in striking up a conversation might say, oh, you know, we're having a, you know, a party tomorrow. Or my sister's getting married. I want to invite you. You go to the wedding and boom, you're you're. Christian spouses at the wedding. You don't know what the connect, what the dots are going to be connected for you to get to where you need to go. All you have to do is be open, be strong in your beliefs, your characters, and and the principles of God, and let the Holy Spirit guide you. For me, yeah, it makes perfect sense, and especially also be led. If you're not comfortable going there, don't go. You don't need if. The fact that you're asking even makes me believe that maybe you feel you should be going, but your conscience is saying maybe you shouldn't go. Just go anywhere you're comfortable. If you don't want to go, do not go. You know, especially in 2024, just be led by the Spirit of God. If you're not comfortable with it, don't go. If you like to go, go. If you don't want to go, stay at home or watch a movie or hang out with somewhere else. Don't. It's good to socialize, but especially when it comes to places that you're not too sure about, please do not go. Okay, I think in terms of the age, again, you know, let your confidence be in God. God knows the age that you want, you know, because you're hanging around with young people doesn't mean 
that God cannot make an opportunity. They may have an uncle, they may have a brother, they may even have a colleague, but don't deprive yourself of the opportunity for, for the Holy Spirit to direct you to your, to your spouse just because you're hanging around with the people that you don't think are the right ones. You know, at the end of the day, there's nothing wrong in just going out and having a good time with people. Nothing wrong with that. So um, the next question, should you be having practice conversations with people, whether male or female, if you're not interested in them and you're scared of being accused of leading them on? Oh, let me read this again. Should you be having practice conversations with people, whether male or female, if you're not interested in them and you're scared of being accused of leading them on? This is I'm, I'm interested in the choice of words here. Yeah. When you say practiced um, conversation, I'm not entirely sure um, what you mean. Uh, I mean, I would expect you to have a normal conversation with, with anyone that you meet. Uh, we discuss whatever is there as a common to topic uh, to be to, to be discussed. But practice conversation means that you are you know you're, you're practicing for something. I'm, I'm, I'm not too sure what that might be. Um, but relationships and marriages are birthed out of friendship, and that's always the, the, the first step along that ladder to marriage. It, it comes um, from having a friend, and a friend is someone that you have something in common with him. The Bible says two cannot walk together unless they walk, unless they agree. So you, 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 you strike up a conversation with someone and you discuss anything. It could be the weather, it could be computing, it could be HR, it, it, it could be traveling, it could be, it could be anything. You find common interests that spark a friendship that will enable you and maybe lead to a relationship that might lead to marriage. Um, so nothing comes in about a practice because if everything that you want to say is practiced, what happens when you run out of things to say? It, it should be natural and organic. It should never be something that you plan now, oh, I'm going to talk about this, that, and the other. A, a friendship should be natural, it should be organic. It, it, you should be able to sit down in the company of someone at some point and not even say a word and still feel, com and still feel comfortable in the silence that surrounds you and, and just enjoy um, the, as my wife would say, the ambience <laughs> of the place where you might be. <laughs> but you should be able to be that comfortable with the person that the conversation becomes a secondary matter. It's just enjoy each other's company. So when you say practice, I don't need to be sound so contrived that all you're trying to do is to aim at something. What happens when you get it? Are you going to run out of conversation? Let it be a friendship. Let it be organic and enjoy the company and the journey towards marriage. I think I'm, good. I'm not sure who sent this question, but I'm going to go on the link because I've read it again a couple of times. And let me ask you, if, if, if I'm wrong, please feel free Can to... I help? Can I help? Okay. Okay. All I was just trying to say, I I have a lot of banter with people, and I'm somebody who makes friends easily. But I've been accused in the past of leading men on. And I've been told that, oh, this one comes, is not good. This one comes, is not in your destiny. This one comes, is not in your destiny. And to be fair, I really do not think they're in my destiny. But I do enjoy their company as friends. But I'm trying to find out, um, is it because I don't know how to make conversation with them? And because I'm scared of being, being told that I have led them on in the past, I don't even know what to say to them because I enjoy banter. So how mm -hmm. do I know where to draw the line? And banter is actually my second nature. It's natural for me to banter with people. I do it in the office. I do it outside. I can see a stranger outside and say, my goodness, I love your tie. But that doesn't mean that I want to marry them. It doesn't mean I'm interested in them. But I don't know whether it's... Let me try and be a bit specific now and say, is it that our flavor have missed it in that they read between the lines and think you're trying to... Uh, flirt with them maybe I can use that mm. but I don't I'm just being natural yeah 
Um, I hear you, and, and I hear your heart as well. Yeah, and, so um, my and I do understand that. Um, is, you know, trying to say what, where do I draw the line? I'm just being mm -hmm. normal. Yeah, and I'm enjoying okay. the conversation, but I I don't have any. I'm not interested in them. Yeah, but I I'm worried that if I keep on running away then I may get to a point where I will not be able to talk to a male person. And I'm finding that actually when they're in my space, I'm just giving an example. It's really practical. Mm -hmm. When I'm sitting in a car with, let, let's assume I'm sitting in the car with a male. I cannot look them in the eye. I'm scared to death. I'm thinking, my God, they're too close. You understand? I, I know that that is a problem for me. But if it's a large room, I can say anything to them. And I will feel very comfortable. But if they're right beside me, I'm panic. I'm almost having a heart attack. That I, I can't. I guess, uh, there, there are sometimes so we... what I mean by yeah. You read. You try to break it down, but that's my question or whatever it is. Contribution. Yeah. Right? Thank you. Sure. That. Go ahead, Jay. I, I hear. I hear where you are coming from, but and, and sometimes out of um the, the fear and sometimes out of the panic. That we have, we sometimes try and overcompensate in, in in our in our attitudes and in our manner of speech and in our manner of behavior, and sometimes that might give off the wrong impression or, or, or the wrong image of not 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 something we've been trying to do deliberately, but unintentionally it comes across that because we try and you know um, try and fit in and, and, and we end up um, overcompensating. Now, if this is something that's happened to you on multiple occasions, if it's a recurring theme, then maybe there might be room for kind of like dialing it down a little bit. And I can guarantee you there are some people out there who just love your character. And there are some people out there who might just be put off um, by your character. But that's natural. There are, there are people out there also who will not be able to stand somebody who is just quiet and doesn't speak, you know. But there are people out there who just like someone who is bubbly and will embrace them uh, and, and take them from what they are. But in the midst of everything as well, we have to learn that we are all work in progress. So what you ask yourself is, what can I take from this? How can I improve? Do I need to dial it down a little bit? Do I need to be more watchful in the things that I say? And then we can make some adjustments and then uh, uh, we'll find the perfect person that fits us. Um, but never try to be somebody that you are not simply because you want to fit in. Because the problem therein is that you cannot sustain it when it comes into a relationship because it's not your natural you. Your natural you is what your, your partner wants. Something that, you know, when he meets you, this is who you're going to be when you are married and all that kind of stuff. But if you are putting on an act for a short period of time, it's not sustainable. So try and be yourself. But within being ourselves, we also need to make adjustments and corrections in our attitudes and manner of speech and the way we go about things. And that's maybe something that you might have to like bear in mind. And like I've said in my message, you, we look ourselves in the mirror and say, where can I improve? Um, so this is about you knowing who you are, um, but trying to find your own space where you are comfortable and, uh, uh, and, and a character that you can sustain all the way through relationship and onto marriage. Very good. Um, can I also add, because it's a very peculiar, just before you, 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 you came in, I actually was going to assume that this was a guy. And uh, the reason why is because we do have, and even, you know, as, as a single person previously, I've experienced it where, you know, there are men who, you know, will be very um, up, 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 you know, in your face and they will show kindness and all that kind of thing. And you start to assume that maybe there is an interest, right? So it was very interesting the way you wrote your question saying practice, you're practicing, and that you may not be interested in that person. If you flip it around, nobody wants to be practiced on, you know? And um, I know in the past, we used to call people like that who show <laughs> interest or who maybe Sorry. not necessarily interest, but just their behavior, the way, you know, you're not interested in me, but you're calling me, you're, you know, making sure I have a seat in church before I come there. You know, you are giving me some wrong, you know, some wrong, sorry for me, what did you say? There's some wrong impressions. Exactly. So we also have to be 
take take it as you know our responsibility to care for the other person you know if you don't want to give the wrong impression then maybe be very wise in the way you approach even though it's your personality if you you know before you approach a person and show so much um um kindness and all that just be aware of their feelings and their emotions you know mm -hmm. Because you don't want to practice on people, you know, it's not fair on them. Just like you don't want someone to practice on you, you know, you can curb it a little bit just to make sure that it is on a friendship level. You can make it very clear from the very beginning. Oh, don't worry. You know, I'm just admiring your tie, you know, very good. I'm sure, you know, your girlfriend will like, you know, like just be wise the way you do it so that it doesn't give a wrong impression. And, you know, they don't see you as, you know, just wanting to you know, play on people's emotions. I think that's what I would say concerning that. For me. Yeah, completely agree with you, especially if you if they are Dupsey and Jolomi have said it all. Okay. I think we only have a couple more questions. Take one more, one more. Yes. Here okay. We so we have this one. I'm grateful that you're emphasizing we should not be isolated and be thinking more of the marriage. But what happens when the husband takes his spouse so far away and makes it difficult to follow up or assess the situation? What I mean is some men just don't want to be accountable. They don't want to be accountable. How do you encourage a wife who has been isolated and the man has deliberately moved away from her, moved her, away just to be in control she's suffering in silence do we then from do we have from scratch who we will be accountable to do we understand this question um it, no not really can you read it again it appears this is a, it. yeah it appears this is a married relationship already yeah. i am grateful that you are emphasizing we should not be isolated and be thinking more of the marriage but what happens when the husband takes his spouse so far away and makes it difficult to follow up or assess the situation. What I mean is some men just don't want to be accountable. They don't want to be accountable. How do you encourage a wife who has been isolated and the man has deliberately moved her away just to be in control? She's suffering in silence. So I think there are two straight questions in there. One of it is and Jolam, if you picked up another one, just shout. One of it is start talking about this person that has moved away or they're already married, and then some men not just wanting to be accountable. Okay? So I, I think Jolam will take the first one. Some men not just being wanting to be accountable to anyone. Go on. Um, I hesitate. <laughs> and the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm saying that is because Obviously, we 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 are hearing just um, a snippet of of what's happening here, and um, I wouldn't want to say something that could be misconstrued. Uh, if he is isolating, he's, he's gone far away, as as you've put it, in um, there's a distance, physical distance between you. Something must have happened somewhere along the line to have brought about. That distance, um, we are not privy um, to that, and therefore it's really difficult to make a um, a, a comment um, from afar. But the Bible just says that we should live with peace um, with all men, as it is within our power to do so. So, if there are things that needs to be addressed on 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 both sides, I think an open conversation regarding that um, should exist to close this gap that has now that that has that has now developed. Um, I know that if it was the woman that had moved away, it would it would have been for a reason, rightly or wrongly. The same applies to the guy, rightly or wrongly. Like I said, we're not privy to anything that's happening here. So, but I do believe that communication and sitting down to talk, maybe inviting somebody, maybe you've got to the stage where, as the Bible says, you have to bring in somebody else to try and mediate um, between be, between you to bring some some wisdom um, to address this, this peculiar situation. But I wouldn't want to 
jump to any conclusions, not knowing fully what has happened because it might be misleading. Um, again, we're assuming that this is a married situation. And if it's the other way around where you're still in a relationship and you're not married, then um, like Fumi had said earlier, you know, don't isolate yourself. You know, don't isolate yourself. We live in a, in, in, in a time of social media. We have WhatsApp. You can find help. You can find people that you can be accountable to, to help you. So don't isolate yourself. It's 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 not a it's not healthy for your relationship, and it's definitely not healthy for a marriage. So um, I'm hoping that this person, if you need further counselling, um, please let us know. Um, our email address is w. I'm sorry, info at single not satisfied. dot co. dot uk. I may um, we can pass you on to Pastor DC, who might be able to talk further with you and i think that's all the questions we have thank you very much everyone and i'll hand it back to Fumi. oh thank you so much again thank you for joining it's been an awesome awesome time we look forward to praying with you on friday i'm going to pray before we go hallelujah god thank you thank you thank you because of what you have already done thank you for what you have started in the lives of all these lovely beautiful people Thank you for awesome testimonies. We look forward, oh God, to what you are do, going to do in 2024. And we thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you. We'll see you on Friday if you want to join us for prayer. If not, we'll see you on the 10th of February. God bless you. Same Zoom link anyway. God bless yeah. you and thank you for thank joining you. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Thanks for joining in. Thank God you, everybody. Bless. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, bye.